All right, let's call this meeting to order. Welcome everybody to tonight's meeting, Halifax West Community Council, December 5th. The time is six o'clock, and before we move on to our election of chair, I'd like to uh, do our land acknowledgement that Halifax Regional Municipality is located on Mi'kmaq, the ancestral traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people, and the municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. And with that, we will go to the election of chair and I will vacate the chair, pass it on to the clerks. All right, good evening. I'm going to call for the election of chair for the Halifax and West Community Council. Are there any nominations for the position of chair? Yep, push your button. No microphone yet. Okay, great, thank you. I would like to nominate Councillor Way Mason for chair, please. Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations for the position of chair? And one more time, nominations are closed. Councillor Mason, do you accept the Perfect. nomination? Okay, we just need a motion now to appoint Councillor Mason as chair. Moved by Councillor Stoddart, second by Councillor Cleary <laughs> to, not, to appoint Councillor Mason to the position of chair for the Halifax and West Community Council. All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, that's. That motion is passed. I will turn the floor over to your newly elected chair. Too late, suckers. Thank you all very much. Do we need a second to reprogram? All right. Mm -hmm. There, like magic. Oh, that's fine. We'll ignore the time. Uh, we learned that the hard way the other day. Can't reprogram that during a meeting. Okay, so that is done. We're done the election of chair. Thank you very much for the uh, confidence colleagues. Uh, we'll move on to 1.2 annual election of vice chair. So I'll call for nominations for the position of vice chair, Councillor Morse. Thank you. I nominate Councillor Cuddle for vice chair. Councillor Cuddle has been nominated. Is there a seconder? Second by Councillor Smith. Is there a N uh, any further nominations? Can't see, I'm still logging in on the computer, so we'll put hands please if you're, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Newly Elected Chair. Um, I would be happy to uh, nominate uh, Councillor Iona Stardard if she's interested. Is there a seconder? Is there a seconder? You can, and you can set and nominate yourself. So. Okay. Uh, so we have Councillor Stoddard has been uh, nominated uh, by Councillor Cleary, seconded by Councillor uh, Smith. Is uh, uh, Do you accept the nomination? I didn't ask Councillor Cuddle that. Do you accept the nomination, Councillor Cuddle? Yeah. Do you accept the nomination, Councillor Stoddard? We have two nominations that have been duly uh, moved and seconded. Uh, are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? We'll move to a vote.
So we're waiting for the votes to be tabulated. Our solicitor, I'm not looking. So we had a tie. So this is interesting because we thought we might have a tie at a committee the other day. So we go to a vote for a second time, I believe. Yes, that's right. So with a tie in under AO1, uh, you would vote again. Uh, you have the option to um, decide if you want to change your uh, vote or uh, if it results in a tie a second time, uh, basically the solicitor will then uh, basically draw a name. So just to be clear, rather than have five or six hundred votes like the House of Con uh, Representatives in the U.S. Congress, we'll move to a random draw. Okay, we have another draw. <laughs> so right. the solicitor will uh, draw a name. <laughs> or a dry cup, a hat. Here, get an MD. <laughs> don't look, don't look, don't look. I can't even see you. And the winner is Councillor Stoddard. Congratulations, Councillor Stoddard. This is really must-see TV today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, 1.3 tabling of, uh, and, and thank you both for running. So uh, 1.3 is tabling of the 2023 annual report. Uh, so the, uh, we have uh, public participation of speakers up to a maximum of five minutes. Please keep your comments respectful on topic and directed to the chair. The clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds remaining and your time is complete for all speakers. Speakers can also participate uh, if they're present in the chamber, but also via Zoom. Yeah, those are our high tech uh, notifications of 30 seconds and stop the signs. Uh, you had to register for Zoom by 4.30 p.m. the day prior to this meeting and we had no one register. Since there are no names on the list, I will call three times and ask, ask if there are any speakers present in the gallery. Is there anyone in the gallery who'd like to speak to our annual report? Is there anyone in the gallery who'd like to speak to our annual report? Is there anyone who'd like to speak? Uh, seeing none, I'll call for a motion to table the 2023 annual report as presented. Moved by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Cuddle. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I believe question was called. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? That passes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of November 21st, 2023. Moved by Councillor Morris, seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Any further discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move to vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carries. Approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions, Madam Clerk. The clerk's office has no additions or deletions. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any additions or deletions or modifications to the order of business? 
Seeing none, it's on care to put a motion on the floor to adopt the order of business as presented. Councillor Cleary, seconded by Councillor Cuddle. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll consider the question called. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries. Uh, there, so there are no business, there is no business arising out of the minutes. There is, uh, that brings us to call for declaration of conflict of interest from the members. Are there any conflicts of interest? Seeing none, uh, we'll move to, there are no modus, motions of rescission or reconsideration or deferred business. There are no notices of tabled matters, which brings us to 10, what we're all really here for, 10.1 public hearings. And then we'll start with 10.1.1, Plan App 2023-00465, rezoning of Four Cherry Lane, Halifax. So thank you for joining us for this public hearing. So we're gonna start with staff uh, presenting and then questions of clarification on what staff present. We'll then give the application and uh, the applicant an opportunity to present. After that, we'll go to a public hearing and speakers can participate for a maximum of five minutes. Again, please keep your comments respectful on topic and directed to me as chair. The clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is completed uh, for all speakers. And after everyone on the list has been given an opportunity to speak, I will call three times to see if there are any additional speakers. Speakers can also participate by Zoom. As a reminder to those watching, you have to sign up by 4.30 p.m. yesterday, the day, business day prior. Uh, however, there is no deadline for speaking in person in chambers. Clerk, can you confirm if any additional correspondence has been received on this public hearing since the meeting, the beginning of the meeting today? No correspondence has been received for item 10.1.1. Thank you very much. So we'll move to the staff presentation. I see Paul. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of Council, my name is Paul Sampson um, with the Urban Applications Group. Uh, so planning application 465 before you this evening is uh, application for rezoning of 4 Cherry Lane, Halifax. The proposal is by KWR approvals uh, and Kevin Riles is here to present uh, following my presentation. Uh, the location is for Cherry Lane in Spryfield, and the proposal is for a uh, 19-unit apartment building through the rezoning process, which is an amendment to the land use bylaw. So the site is in Spryfield near the intersection of Old Samba Road and Herring Cove Road. The site is approximately 23,000 square feet in area or uh, about half an acre. Uh, it's located close to... Um, the uh, Cherry Lane is located close to the intersection, as you see on the right image. So this is a view looking from the south. Uh, the site is uh, includes one hose uh, to the left of the image, and uh, it contains an auto repair uh, business. And this is a view from the east, and it, this view shows a, a mix of uses in the area, the surrounding area. So there's a mix of apartment buildings and uh, houses in the, in the foreground. Um, and in the background, you see in the immediate area, that you see the commercial portion of Herring Cove Road. And this is the street view from Cherry Lane. Um, it shows the existing dwelling on the left. And this is just a view uh, up Cherry Lane to the east uh, from, from Herring Cove Road. Shows the site on the left. So the, in terms of the overall uh, layers of planning policy and regulation, uh, we start with the regional plan and the subdivision, regional subdivision bylaw. Um, so this uh, guides growth and, and tells us where future settlement areas and, and investment and services. Um, and then there's the community plan level, which is where we're at with this application. In this case, it's the Halifax Municipal Planning Strategy and the Halifax Mainland Land Use Bylaw. Um, and then the land use bylaw itself kind of dictates as of right development and what can what can be located, what types of uses can be located in, in each zone. So in terms of the rezoning process, uh, we are um, 
we're, we're currently at the public hearing. Um, prior to today, we went through detailed staff review of the proposal. We had public engagement and uh, prepared a report. And this, uh, the staff report came to council back on November 21st. Uh, following tonight uh, and council's uh, decision, if, if the decision is tonight, then there's a 14-day appeal period where uh, someone can appeal council's decision to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. So in terms of the site, uh, there's it's a service site with sewer and water services. The zoning is R2P. This information is all in the staff report. Uh, the, the land use designation and the planning strategy is medium density residential. Um, auto repair use on the site and existing single unit dwelling and um, the, the enabled policy here is the it's the mainland so secondary planning strategy and the key policy here is policy 1.3.1 um, and the, uh, the there's a full policy review in the staff report as attachment C it, uh, it goes over a number of policies within the planning strategy but the key policy here is policy 131 in mainland south so it enables council to consider a rezoning application within the medium density residential designation um, so in in considering that council sh uh, must look at um, compatibility with the area and as well uh, the the height limit in the R3 zone, for example, is four stories. That's the maximum limit. And also the adequacy of infrastructure. So the proposal, um, which is, is subject to change in any rezoning application, but the current proposal is for a 19-unit residential building. This is a, an image of the site plan. It um, shows a building to the rear of the site in order to meet the, the zoning requirements. Uh, there's parking out in front, and there's a landscape perimeter, which is required by the R3 zone. Um, and this is just an image of the proposed floor plans, uh, three levels uh, with a total of 19 units. Uh, the, the 19 unit, the, 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 the R3 zone has a, uh, a maximum population density for the, based on the size of the site and the size of the street frontage that it has. Um, so 19 units is an approximate estimation of the maximum number of units. So in terms of uh, public engagement, we had, uh, we conducted a mail out to residents in the area. We have the information on the website and also signage on the site. We mailed out 154 notices. There wasn't a whole lot of feedback. We only had uh, two phone calls and one email, I believe. Um, 239 web page views. Um, so, the in terms of feedback received, there's just a couple concerns about the area already has enough development and um, also the concerns with traffic on on Cherry Lane. Um, it being kind of like a, an, an older, undersized street. Uh, so uh, the, these are listed. These concerns are listed in the in the uh, the staff report as well as staff's review of the policies. And uh, we recommend in favor of and recommend the council adopt <coughs> adopt the proposed rezoning. And I can answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. Are there any questions from council? <coughs> Seeing none, you're relieved of duty for now and. Uh, I would ask uh, the applicant, Kevin Riles, to come forward and provide your presentation. Good evening, uh, Chairman uh, Mason and members of Community Council. <coughs> Excuse me, Kevin Riles with KWR, Best of the Seasons, by the way. Um, here representing our developer property owner, Steve Farrell, who's behind me, will be making a few comments tonight, and our architect, uh, Peter Henry, is uh, also with us. Um, just want to follow up staff with just a few brief comments uh, on the presentation. 
Uh, as Paul mentioned, you know, fairly large property, 23,000 square feet, 367 in total, um, about 60% of an acre. Um, you can see on this drawing, just for interest sake, um, the yellow is the Herring Cove Road. So on the far right, you'll see the proposed bus rabbit uh, transit walk shed, and the red square is where Four Cherry Lane. So it's in the proposed walk shed, um, and you can also see coming up a couple of bus stops very close to it. Um, this is just to give you an idea to follow up uh, the planner, some of the use. It's clearly in a mixed use area. So you'll see this dashed red line. That's the notification area. So we often call that the neighborhood within the community. So you can see, you know, the green buildings there, the mix of uh, apartment buildings, some two units, also some single family. Across the street, you've got the fire station, uh, the Petrocan, and a couple of offices. Um, this just shows the zoning itself, the highlighting. Um, you see the property is abutting R2P. In one the rear, it's abutting already an existing R3 multiple family. Uh, to the east, there's an R3, and across the street, there's three apartment buildings. Um, this just highlights it in a different tone. Um, and you can see some of the existing apartment buildings in the area. So in the rear, you've got a 25-unit apartment building. Uh, to the east, you've got that nine-unit. Across the street, you also have a 19-unit, an eight and a six. Um, this is the site plan, you know, uh, wedge-shaped flag-type lot. You see Civic number four there. Um, to the rear, there's a commercial garage. So this is where basically trucks, um, backhoes, vehicles are repaired. Um, and you've got the garage there for the existing house. Uh, beside it, you've got eight Cherry Lane. On the other side, you've got two. Um, this is a nice image to kind of give you a sense of what's there right now. So the commercial garage in the back and the house and the shed, uh, if council deemed advisable to approve, would all be demolished in lieu of the new apartment building. Um, this just gives a highlight again of the plan. Um, just because of the two residential properties, there's a fence and buffering that would occur on both sides uh, as you would come in, and that would provide some buffering. The property actually, as you go towards the rear slopes down in a little bit of a gully, so you'll see coming up what the view would be approximately from uh, Cherry Lane. So from Cherry Lane, it actually looks like a two-story, and then because of the gully, the three stories is actually at the rear. Um, just some facts, as you see here, um, three stories in height, um, significant buffering and fencing. Um, the 19-unit building would be 14 one-bedrooms. They would range from 411 square foot studios to 757 square foot one-bedrooms. You'd have five two-bedrooms, nice size, 976 square feet to 1,100. Um, the parking and bike parking meets all the R3 zone requirements. Uh, the building is kept low to fit in with the neighborhood and comply with the angle controls of the R3. Uh, surface parking is provided to keep it affordable. Um, some of the accessible units are located on the main floor, level two, and the building takes advantage of the natural topography. Um, straightforward in construction technology, the building has gracious window sizes and balconies, and some suites will have walkout garden terraces, and it's meant to be a contemporary look uh, to give the brand a fresh and innovative feel. Um, just interesting, within the actual notification area that uh, Paul had mentioned earlier, um, you'll see the breakdown. So actually about 40% of the dwelling units are multi-res, two-unit, or commercial. Um, it's estimated that of the 118 uh, residents, 80 live in apartments um, in the immediate notification area. Um, this is just a view from the rear. So again, remember as the topography dips, um, you see the three stories at the rear. Um, from the front view, um, you've got a modest in height, which is two stories. Again, another view from the rear. And this is just a representation. So if you're coming up Cherry Lane, you'll see on the immediate left and right, there'll be some fencing and buffering. And then you'll have some parking leading up to it. And then you'll have the two stories on the front. And then as you get towards the rear, that's where the three stories opens up. So really pretty, pretty modest three stories is the height of a, you know, uh, often a normal single family residence. Uh, and if there's any questions, Mr. Chair, would be happy to answer them from Community Council. I don't think any of us will complain that you had five minutes left. Thank you very much, Mr. Rouse. By the way, your uh, 
looking even more elegant than before COVID. I'm very impressed. Uh, good to see you again. I think this is the first time I've seen you in a while. Uh, there are, uh, Councillor Cuddle is on the list. Councillor Cuddle for questions of clarification. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, uh, uh, this is great, very you know, beautiful design. The thing I love about Spryfield is that it has so much low rise hidden density uh, with apartments kind of spread throughout the community. So you know, I think conceptually that, that works. Uh, my questions of clarification are um, in particular to the drawings and uh, kind of uh, there seems to be a mismatch of information. So at some point it said four stories where the drawing showed two, three stories, two at the front and three at the back. So I'm just wondering where the fourth story is. Also, it said five, two bedrooms, whereas with the three levels in the drawings, there's only four two bedrooms. So, uh, just the, how, just, I'm just wondering, is this four stories? Is it three stories? Is it how many units? And uh, uh, where does that fit with the drawings? Uh, thanks. You, uh, thank you, Councillor Cuddle. It's three stories, so um, that should have been better clarified. The four stories was meant to be a maximum height, so the design proposed would be three stories. Okay. And then where would the five, where would the five two bedrooms come in? Um, I'll leave that question to the architect. Actually, so specifically on the plan, um, he could probably best address that. Okay. Can he address that, or can we address that now, Mr. Chair? I'll allow it since you've been so using uh, so little of your time, and it's a pretty straightforward question. That's allowed, right? The lawyer says that's allowed, so we're good. Uh, thanks for the hard question there, Councillor Cuddle. Um, my quick answer to that is that we may have counted wrong. Uh, there are 19 units in total. The population densities are entirely compliant with R3 zone. Uh, the number of two bedroom, we may be in error. The, it may, there may only be four two bedrooms. Uh, we've seen various versions of this. Uh, this is a project that's been a long time in my office. And you know, we have many versions. So sometimes it just, there's, a, there's just an arithmetic error that's been made. I suspect that's the case here. For the record, could you identify yourself? I'm sorry, uh, I'm Peter Henry, the architect. Uh, of you. this project, not just the architect. <laughs> <laughs> Although it, has a I nice, that would it be does nice. have a nice yeah. ring to it, I must say. Uh, Councillor Cuddle for a follow-up. Peter, you are the architect. Um, so, so okay, so I just confused because the presentation was presenting one thing and the submitted drawings are another. So I just want to be really clear, when we approve something this evening, what are we going off the presentation? Are we going off the documents submitted? And do, and do we need to get some clarity around around any of this we'll at this go, point? Legal is going to pop in here. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the council. What we're approving here is the rezoning. So it would be anything that is permitted within the zone. It's not the specific drawings or specific unit count. It's the zoning. It's the zoning. And then, the, okay, so we can kind of block the images that we've just seen and the plans we've just seen that have been submitted kind of out of our brains and just think that tonight we are actually, what we're focused on is approving a four-story building, approving zoning for a four-story building, um, but that the unit count, and I'm just wondering if there's a plan or and maybe I'll have to bring up Mr. Sampson again. Well, that, that would be a question, I think, for staff at the end of the public yeah, hearing because okay. we're, we're just doing questions of clarification with the applicant right now. Okay. I'll save that for my next yeah. round. Thank uh, you. Is there something else you'd like to add there? Uh, if we could go back to presenter four, please. Push on. Oh, there we are. Okay. I'm talking again. Great. Um, so uh, uh, your solicitor was entirely clear on exactly what I was about to say. The, the application this evening is for a rezoning for the property. We've, we've made a design that fits that rezoning. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, well, it's a story under the maximum height um, and is compliant in all other ways. Because it's always good to know not to approve these things in the abstract, but actually to say, well, show me what, you're, show me what we're going to get. And that's, I think, what we set out to do. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, there will come a time when a building permit application is made and a development agreement or development permit will be achieved 
and it too will have to be compliant with the R3 zone in all ways. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, Councillor Morris for the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm just curious if, uh, if this could change, if the plan might change uh, at the permitting stage, if you, if you are able to go up to four, if that's something you might pursue, or if you're completely wedded to three stories. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Morris. Um, the one advantage of having the rezoning, I mean, it is possible, but generally speaking, given the time frame and uh, the developer can speak for it, the idea is normally after an approval, um, you're going to take three to four months to get your working drawings and go to permits. So the goal of the timing of this is quite nice because by the time the applicant, the developer would get those permits and working drawings, you're coming into the spring which is the perfect time to build. And so the goal would be to build this. Now, if there's a shift in the marketplace, but as you can see here, there's a nice range. Uh, I can tell you from a lot of experience, three to four years ago, you'd never see a 411 square foot studio in Spryfield, but that's the market. So there's a range here from 411 square feet up to 1100. So that range really takes care of it. So just because of the timing of the approvals, the market and the certainty, it's possible, but I can talk into, talking to Steve, the goal would be if council deemed advisable, move towards getting the working drawings, the permits and be in the ground in the spring. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Now on my list is Mayor Mike Savage, but I think it's actually Councillor Lindell Smith. So uh, we will go to Mayor Mike Savage, but we'll get that fixed. Thank you. Are we good? Here, press your button again. All right, uh, there. <laughs> thank you very much. I am not Mayor Mike Savage. Uh, really quickly, just on the, the last question around if, if you can change, and I think the presentation that was mentioned around the um, allowable um, population within the, 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 the area, and I think when we got the staff presentation that, that it was mentioned that you've, I don't want to use the word maxed out, but maxed out, the, the what's allowable on the site. So from that, you wouldn't really be able to, and, and this is again, the clarification. So would you even be able to add another story and not go past your population allow, uh, allowed? Or can you do that? From my understanding, you can't, but I'm just wondering if that's we'll possible. Go to the applicants. Uh, so the, 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 quest, the question is, I think, easily answered. We're allowed to put, uh, there's a certain population density that we're not allowed to exceed, and we're not planning to exceed it. Right. Uh, might we put another story on top of it? Well, we might, but it, we would not be well advised to do so. Uh, it's expensive and, and more straightforward to do what we're doing. A three-story building, is, we should be obvious, the same number of units in a, th in a three-story building is more economic to construct than would be a, the same number of units in a four-story building. Right. If, if that's... I think that's kind of obvious. Uh, and so that's our plan. So the, the other thing to say is that the R3 zone is kind of a tricky zone. It has contain, contains what are called angle controls. And uh, if you stood on the property line and drew a line up at 60 degrees, you cannot intersect the building. So in other words, the taller the building gets, the more, like, the more, uh, the more setback that you need in order to comply with that aspect. So the three stories is also a, a, a nice uh, compliance with the R3 zone in that regard. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Sure. Sure. There are no further questions. Uh, uh, Councillors on the list to ask questions to the applicants, so we'll let you go. Uh, should anyone come forward in the next phase, we may have you back. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so, uh, if I'm reading the sheet correctly, there, is ni there are neither people signed up nor in Zoom. Is that correct, uh, Madam Clerk? So, uh, no one has signed up to speak uh, in either means. Is there anyone uh, here who cares to speak? I will call three times. Is there anyone here who cares to speak on this item? Is there any, oh, we have a speaker. Please come forward. Yeah, you can sit or stand and you can identify yourself in what community you're from, please. We'll go to present, presenter four, please. Yes, uh, my name is Steve Forwell. I'm the property owner at Four Cherry Lane. Um, yeah, I just wanted to obviously introduce myself, um, thank the, the city for and the city planner 
uh, for the work they've done uh, getting this to this point. Um, I'm a resident of the area. I've been active in the uh, Spryfield area in apartment rental for the past 20 years. Um, and yeah, like I said, I think it's a great opportunity to, um, to uh, utilize or maximize some, uh, some density within an area that's, you know, that there is potential to um, and it'd be a nice addition to the area um, and clean up that, uh, the uh, property as it, as it is now, a, you know, an automotive repair shop in people's backyard, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any further speakers? Are there any further speakers? Are there any further speakers? Uh, does the applicant wish to respond to the applicant? <laughs> no, that's a no, all right. Uh, so uh, we have a motion to move close public hearing, second it, all those in favor? Uh, are there any questions for staff before we move to putting the motion on the floor? We have a question from Councillor Morris, if you'd come forward, Mr. Sampson. Councillor Morris, and then Councillor Cuddle. Could you say a little bit about the road and access? It doesn't look completely standard uh, leading up to the building, the laneway there. Um, Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you. Um, so the, um, the the traffic impact statement was prepared, and uh, like a lot of streets, local streets in Spryfield, there, there's there are older streets, uh, more narrow than what we would construct today. Um, but uh, but staff have reviewed our engineering staff, and and it was reviewed by traffic and uh, there were no concerns raised. So, uh, you know, despite the fact that the streets aren't what we would build today, they still can accommodate the proposal and there's, and, and, and probably others in the immediate area without any concerns, so. Okay. That's great, that's all, thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, good to see you, Paul. Um, so, uh, just a couple questions. Um, one is about the gully. Um, you know, something I've been noticing in Spryfield recently with uh, some of the rainstorms we've been having um, is more intensity around storm water and how it's um, diverted and um, absorbed in the ground. And I'm just wondering, in terms of having that kind of gully, that low point in that property at the back, if that's uh, performing currently any kind of um, storm water absorption or stormwater function um, and if that needs to be that if, if that will be considered an environmental study um, when we look at if it, when we look at the lot and the development of the lot if that any of that's being considered um, the other piece is around requirement for accessibility and I think I know the answer to this but I'm going to ask it anyway is there any requirement for any of these units to be accessible um, and if so how many and um, well, just a little bit about the traffic study. Um, I mean, that is, that is a tricky intersection there where you have Cherry Lane coming on to Heron Cove Road and you have the intersection for Old Sambro Road, um, kind of right there, kind of kitty corner. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a busy intersection. It is a tricky intersection. And I'm just wondering when the traffic study was done, did it, did it also look at um, any traffic turning onto the Herring Cove Road or um, in that particular intersection? And as well, I've been getting some requests from um, residents, even though it's technically uh, Councillor Cleary's district, um, for traffic calming on those side streets because they're often used as a cut through to get to, um, uh, you know, down and across and onto Purcell's Cove Road through the neighborhood. So just wondering if that was considered at all either. Uh, so maybe what I'll do is just jump back to the stormwater issue. Um, so my understanding is that at the permitting stage that there has to be like a lot grading pl plan submitted and, and stormwater information provided at, at that at that stage. So they, they um, Essentially, they have to design so that the stormwater is managed on on site. Um, so, um, so that's kind of handled at that time. Um, so, I have no in other information at this point on it, but there are regulations and rules in place to to deal with that. Um, in terms of the traffic 
Um, so there was an initial traffic study, or TIS, um, and, uh, and then the applicant had the, the traffic statement revised to, uh, I think there were a few things that had to be updated. They, they updated um, uh, more recent stats and more recent information on, on transit was added. Um, so on two separate occasions, our engineers looked at that looked at that study and they were satisfied. So in terms of the details of what was actually looked at in terms of the intersections, um, I mean, whatever information that was requested was supplied and, and they reviewed that and, and were okay with that. So like I said, there were no, there were no traffic issues raised. Um, the second part of the, the, you, uh, the question though, I, I just, can I get you to repeat that? The, oh, I, um, of the traffic issue? Yeah, I've been getting some calls from uh, local residents around there, not just on Cherry Lane, but on the, the roads that connect to Cherry Lane, um, of uh, requesting traffic calming because people are using those residential streets as kind of cut-throughs, because Heron Cove is um, very busy. So I, I think the, um, I don't know what what order <laughs> staff would, would get to that, um, but I know there is, there's a list <laughs> of streets that where they're reviewing for shortcutting purposes uh, and, and traffic calming purposes. So I don't know where Cherry Lane would sit on that list if, or even if it's on the list. So um, it might be something, I, I don't have the answer for you, but, but our, our traffic department would, uh, or at least be able to tell you if that, if, if Cherry Lane is on that list and maybe it should be, or if, if that's a concern. Um, the other thing I was going to mention with regards to accessibility is I might get the architect to answer that question. Uh, if there's a requirement for accessible units or not, I'm, I'm not sure. So perhaps if that's okay with the solicitor. Absolutely. <laughs> We're making an exception this time, Peter. Don't mess it up. <laughs> I'm doing my best here, what can I tell you? Uh, so the answer is that a third of the units are accessible units. We are not we're imagining uh, installing an elevator. It's, it's, it's a, that's a very expensive thing to do in a building of this size with so few units. Uh, however, uh, fully a third of the units, the ones on the ground floor, will be accessible. Uh, the, the parking plan shows accessible parking immediately adjacent to the front door. And so everybody on that floor will have roll-in uh, units, um, so uh, we don't. We think that this is beyond any standard that I understand uh, for for residential construction. That's great. That's that's good to know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm pretty sure it's one in twenty, isn't it, in National Building Code? So, uh, good work there. Uh, there's no further questions from Council. So, Council, what is your wish? Uh, Councilor Cleary. Have we closed, we closed the public hearing, didn't we? Okay. Um, I'll move that Halifax and West Community Council adopt the amendment to the land use bylaw for Halifax mainland as cited in attachment A of the staff report dated October 30, 2023. Moved by Councilor Cleary, seconder? Seconder. Councilor Cottle. Any further discussion, Councilor Cleary? Uh, just, I mean, this is kind of the, the perfect location for, you know, a modest amount of density. We're talking about 19 uh, units here, a good mix of units. It's 300 meters to a pharmacy. It's 400 meters uh, to the Sobeys grocery store. It's on a major bus route. The traffic circulation, when you come out of Herring Cove Road to go back to Circle, uh, you know, it's easy to get around. Uh, and frankly, it would be nice to stop receiving complaining calls about the auto repair uh, or as most residents consider it, um, auto sales, used auto sales, because I, I think some of that might happen either. Um, and so, and to Councillor Cuddle's question, uh, so it, um, the streets that connect, so Circle is in behind, uh, so if you go down Sea View and then to uh, Crest View, uh, Tower View and Bridge View have all been traffic calmed, they have speed tables on them. Um, Cl uh, Ch Clovis and Joyce, I'm trying to remember which one. Joyce was studied, it was below the threshold for speed. Uh, I think Joyce, Clovis is ranked. Uh, and so when you think about um, uh, traffic calming, 
that's actually happened in the neighborhood already. Unfortunately, Twin Oaks, Cherry, McMullen are too short uh, to qualify for traffic calming. The AO says you have to be 150 meters or more. These are all under 150 meters, so they don't actually qualify. Anyway, uh, that is to say, uh, I think I, I totally support this. I think it's a great addition to the neighborhood. There are apartments across the street. There are apartments at the corner, uh, and they're all very small and modest, and I think this will be a perfect addition to the neighborhood and allow for a little more uh, population uh, in there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Cleary. There's no further speakers other than the list. Has the question been called? The question has been called. All those in favor? All those opposed? Carries. Thank you very much for coming out for that. We'll move on to 10.1.2 Plan App 2023-00334 Development Agreement 4749 Herring Cove Road, Halifax. So thank you for joining us for a second public hearing today. So we will start with the staff presentation as we did at the last one. And then we'll have questions of clarification for staff. Then we'll give the applicant an opportunity to present. Then we'll go to a public hearing. Speakers can participate as they did in the last one for up to five minutes each. Uh, and we've already covered that you have to have signed up for Zoom by yesterday at 4.30. So I'll ask uh, Alison DeBroda, to, did I get it right? Excellent, thank you for coming forward and uh, take us away on the presentation. All right, good evening members of Halifax and West Community Council. Uh, my name is Alison DeBroda, I'm a planner with the Rural, Pla Rural uh, planning applications and policy team. Uh, and I'm here to present case 2023-00334, which is a development agreement application at 749 Herring Cove Road. So this is an application uh, by Stephen Adams on behalf of the property owner. Uh, it's to expand an existing non-conforming use, which is a sign shop, and this would be through the provisions of a development agreement. To provide some site context, on the left we have the general site location shown in red on Herring Cove Road, and on the right we have the site boundaries shown in red across from Norris Drive and Sarah Drive. This slide shows uh, some context of the site in the neighborhood. So on the left we have the front of the building as it exists today, and on the right we have uh, the site access shown which shows the access to the property on Herring Cove Road, and this is facing northwest. To provide a brief overview of the planning policy landscape, first we have the regional plan and subdivision bylaw. Uh, as Paul stated, this guides where population growth and the investment of services like transit, piped water, and sewer should occur. And then there's the community plan, which outlines where, how, and which types of development may occur. Some uses, like the one we're um, discussing tonight, may only be allowed after community consultation and council approval. We also have the land use bylaw below that, which specifies what can be approved without going to council and seeking feedback from the public. This is known as the, the zoning, the as-of-right development. So the development agreement process uh, has a number of steps, which has brought us to tonight, the public hearing. We received a complete application, staff reviewed it, conducted public engagement, wrote a staff report. Uh, this was given first reading notice of motion two weeks ago. Tonight we're at the public hearing. Uh, following a decision of council, there's a 14 day appeal period where the decision of council is appealable to the utility and review board and the grounds for an appeal is that the decision is not reasonably consistent with the municipal planning strategy. So to provide a, uh, an overview of the site, uh, this is serviced with both municipal, serv municipal sewer and water. The zone is the R2 two-family dwelling zone. It's designated low-density residential. The existing use is commercial, it's a sign shop. And the enabling policy is implementation policy 3.14 in the Halifax Municipal Planning Strategy. So this policy enables council to consider proposals for development agreements to expand or alter structures containing non-conforming uses in the low density residential designation subject to criteria. So these criteria that council must consider uh, in the decision of a development agreement includes items such as whether the development is complementary to the neighborhood and if it provides a benefit, uh, considering how impact might be mitigated to neighboring properties through screening, buffering, and landscaping, uh, considering traffic and items such as controlled vehicular activity, as well as controls on outdoor storage, signage, and noise. 
so to provide some details on the proposal, uh, two additions are proposed, one at the front and one at the rear, one at the rear of the existing building. The outdoor storage on the property for the existing build, uh, business would be moved indoors. There would be a landscaped and fenced buffer provided around the property perimeter and no new signage, parking, or loading areas are proposed and those would remain as they're existing today. Here is the site plan for uh, the proposed additions. The two additions are circled in red and the landscaping is proposed around the property line. Uh, where landscaping isn't proposed as a buffer, um, fencing is proposed instead, and this is just located uh, where the existing building put footprint and the new building footprint are closer to the property line, just in um, a small area at the top left of the screen and bottom middle. So no changes to the access on Herring Cove Road are proposed. And the development agreement will require that the parking lot remains a 20-foot uh, setback from the front property line, is hard surfaced, and has at least 11 parking spaces. For public engagement on this file, we mailed out 105 notifications to neighboring property owners. We received zero individual calls or emails, and the web page views the web page had 241 views. So this was a consultation which we achieved through, again, a mail out notification, a website, and on-site signage. And again, no concerns or feedback were directly shared with the planner. So to go into detail on some of the elements of the development agreement, uh, landscaping would be required prior to development permit issuance, sorry, a landscaping plan, so that would confirm that the landscaping proposed conforms with the site plan that we have uh, um, as scheduled to the development agreement. The, there would be a new screened refuse area. Uh, all outdoor storage on the property would be moved indoors, and the building setbacks for the additions would comply with the underlying R2 zone. And then we have non-substantive amendments as part of the development agreement. So these are changes that can be made to the agreement without a formal public hearing. And so these can be uh, made by the development officer or a community council. And so these uh, in this development agreement include changes to the commencement and completion deadlines as well as change in changes to the landscaping plan. So the staff recommendation contained in the staff report was arrived at after a detailed analysis of all relevant policies in the regional and local municip municipal planning strategies. And staff recommend that council approve the proposed development agreement, which shall be substantially in the same form as set out in attachment A. And thank you, I'm available if you have any questions. Thank you very much. So we have a question from Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Great. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just, um, just a couple of questions around the intended use. Um, while it's non-conforming, right now it's a sign shop um, with the additions of the building. Is there, do you know of any intent to change the commercial use of the building or is that a factor to consider at all? Uh, so thank you. So through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Uh, my understanding is the use wouldn't be changing. Um, I believe it's just an expansion that's needed to a growing business. Um, so just for, um, again, manufacturing of, of signs. And I, I might get the applicant to speak to that if, if I'm off in any way. But uh, my understanding is the use would remain the same. Um, as it is a legal non-conforming use, it's that use that's able to expand. So under the policy to be eligible, it has to be um, the use as it exists today, just expanding in size. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no further questions. Ms. Brody. you can go back to the cheap uh, seats. We'll ask Stephen Adams to come forward and speak on behalf of the applicant. Well, I believe you know the drill, Mr. Adams. So I'm going to go over it with you anyway, just to make sure. No cheering, booing. Just kidding. Uh, you have 10 minutes uh, and uh, our fancy signs, which are new since you were uh, on council, uh, will guide you should you take the full 10 minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I can assure you I won't take 10 minutes. In fact, I'll be shorter presentation than Ms. DeBroda. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair, members of Halifax and West Community Council. My name is Stephen Adams, and I'm before you this evening representing Chris Jeans of NCS Real Estate. Chris is also the owner of New Century Signs, which occupies the site, and Chris is with me this evening. I'd like to thank Allison for her presentation. She outlined the key points in the report, but I'd like to add a few more. This property has been a sign shop since 1990. 
1995, it was down zone from C2 to R2. However, it has remained as a sign shop for 33 years and counting. Mr. Jeans purchased the property in April of 2019. In 2021, he asked that I help him with this application. As Mr. Broda said, 105 letters were sent out. There have been no comments, negative, positive, or otherwise. However, before you, there are two uh, letters from abutting property owners, and uh, they are both supporting this. Uh, one property owner is to the south, which is the former lumber mart. The other property owner is not only to the uh, west, but also to the north. So it encompasses the entire property. Previous to Mr. Jean's purchasing this property, there were several unsightly complaints. After he uh, purchased the property, the complaints had stopped. Scrap metal and old signs had been removed. The brush has been cut and the property is well kept. These improvements pair well with the improvements done at 3 Esso Road, which is south of the property. That used to be a Civic 751 uh, Herring Cove Road, which is the old lumber mark. In closing, the DA is consistent with all applicable policies. It will allow for further improvement to an historically unsightly property. It will ensure appropriate buffering and will offer the opportunity to increase local employment. Based, to, based on these points, I respectfully request that you approve the proposed development agreement, which shall be substantially of the same form as set out in attachment A. Thank you. Good job, Mr. Adams. Two minutes and three seconds. Are there any questions uh, of clarification from members of council? Seeing none, you're relieved. Uh, so we'll now move forward to the public hearing component. No one signed up to speak via Zoom or uh, in advance, so I'll ask the room three times if anyone wishes to speak. Does anyone wish to speak on this matter? Please come forward. Does anyone wish to speak? Third and final time, does anyone wish to speak? Uh, seeing none, I'll ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, moved by Councillor Stoddard, seconded by Councillor Cuddle. All those in favor? Carried. Uh, and so now, are there any questions of clarification for staff after that gripping presentation by Mr. Adams? Uh, seeing none, we'll move to a motion. Council, what is your wish? Councillor Cuddle. Motion on the floor. I move that. Halifax and West Community Council, one, approve the proposed development agreement, which shall be substantially of the same form as set out in attachment A of the staff report, dated September 26, 2023, and two, require the agreement be signed by the property owner within 120 days or any extension thereof, granted by council on request of the property owner from the date of final approval by council and any other bodies as necessary, including applicable, applicable appeal periods, whichever is later. Otherwise, this approval will be void and obligations arising hereunder shall be at an end. Moved by Councillor Cuddle, seconded by Councillor Morris. Councillor Cuddle. Um, you know, um, I don't really have much more to add. Um, I think, you know, everything has been said. This is a, a, a business that has been in the community for for decades. Um, it, uh, it has improved over the last little while, so I just want to give a little nod to, to recognize that. And, um, and, you know, really it's just an addition to an existing building for an existing business. And um, I hope the project goes well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll consider that question called. All those in favor? Opposed? Carries. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move now to correspondence, petitions, and delegations. First, 11.1 .1 correspondence, Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, correspondence has been received for the item that was just heard, 10.1.2, which has been circulated to the Community Council. Any petitions? There are no petitions. Any petitions from members of Council? Seeing none, and there are no presentations today. So we'll now move to public participation. Public participation, is, uh, speakers may speak for a maximum of five minutes. Please keep your comments respectful on topic and directed to me as chair. The clerk will give you uh, the yellow warning sign at 30 seconds and the red sign when you have run out of time. Uh, speakers can participate in person or on Zoom. Uh, I believe we have nobody on either list. Is that correct, Madam Clerk? So once again, we have nobody on either list, so I will call three times. 
But is there anybody here who'd care to speak today? Anyone care to speak today? Third and final time, does anybody want to come forward and speak today? In fact, the looks I'm getting from the audience are there's nothing they want more than to not come forward and speak today. So we'll move on. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there are no information items brought forward. Which brings us to 14.1 staff reports, 14.11 case 2023-00191 development agreement for Belarus away, Halifax. Uh, who wants to come forward with this? I would be looking for a member of council to put the motion on the floor. Am I missing something? Not my. Councillor Cuddle will take one for the team. Councillor Cuddle. Okay. okay. You ready? Um, I move that Halifax and West Community Council give notice a motion to consider the proposed development agreement as set out in attachment A of the staff report dated November 8th, 2023, to allow a single unit dwelling on a lot that does not abut a public street off Bella Rosa Way, Halifax, and schedule a public hearing. Moved by Councillor Cuddle, seconded by Councillor Morse. Anything further? Nothing further. There's no one on the list. I'll consider a uh, question called. All those in favor? Opposed? Good stuff. Moving on to 1412 Plan App 2023-00417 Development Agreement for Reginald Court, Herring Cove. We'll go to Councillor Cuddle. I will put the motion on the floor. Okay. Um, I move that Halifax and West Community Council give notice of motion to consider the proposed development agreement as set out in attachment A of the staff report dated November 9th, 20, I think that should be 2023, um, to allow 20 single detached homes on an extension of Reginald Court in Herring Cove and schedule a public hearing. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Stoddard. Anything further, Councillor Cuddle? Um, nope, I mean, this is just giving notice of a motion to consider the proposed development agreement. Um, I, I will note that um, I think the conservation design here, which is requesting um, a smaller, uh, I'm sure the word's not smaller, a narrower um, lot frontage to preserve the back of this property as open space in its natural state is, is actually really nice to see, as well as the uh, public pathway from this uh, community onto Herring Cove Road, where there is transit available. And it's next to a, a currently um, in construction subdivision. So uh, I guess this will be the next phase and um, we'll see what happens uh, through the process here. Thank you very much. There's no one further on the list, so we'll consider a question called. All those in favor? Opposed? Carries. 1413 uh, Plan App 2023-00651, rezoning of 2 Maria Avenue, Halifax. We'll move to Councillor Cuddle. It's your night. It is, it is. It's, it's the Spryfield show tonight. Um, Okay, I will put the motion on the floor. This is an interesting one. Um, that Halifax and West Community Council give first reading to consider approval of the proposed amendment to the land use bylaw of Halifax mainland as set out in attachment A of the staff report dated November 20th, 2023 to rezone an existing eight 0.75 acre vacant lot at 2 Marie Avenue, Halifax, from the R1, R2, and H zones to P, Park and Institutional Zone, and schedule a public hearing. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Cleary. Anything further, Councillor Cuddle? Um, no, I just wonder, is there staff here that can speak? I just have a, I just have a question about... Um, Two things: one about the process, and, and one about um, reading, you know, reading the, sta uh, the staff report from for the rezoning from R12 H to Park and Institutional, where it already says this has an intent for Park and Institutional. Why why are we here rezoning when the intent is already there? If you could just explain that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Sampson. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so. Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, 
the the designation in the planning strategy is is currently institutional, and, and I think that may be what you're referring to. Um, yes. So um, the so so I guess by being designated institutional, uh, the future intent of the site would be for institutional purposes. It was used as a school um, and the rezone. I'm, I don't know the history of why it wasn't actually zoned P, uh, Park and Institutional. So, um, but but it, it uh, that complies with the, uh, it meets the intent of, of the MPS in that sense. Um, help, that helps maybe? <laughs> okay, um, no, I just, I just think um, as this comes Forward because it is a rather large project um, on that site next to residential, and so I think just the history of the site is important to note, as well as the intent of the site in the MPS, and you know the question around why we why we're at the point where we need to rezone it um, is is probably something that's going to come up um, with the public in terms of asking questions about this particular project. So I think just being able to um, you know describe that and discuss that um, will be an important point moving forward. And my other question around process, again, this is an area that's very interesting. There's been a lot of um, stormwater flooding issues here along this section of Herring Cove Road in particular. And there's a Halifax water facility adjacent to, the, I don't know if it's exactly adjacent, but it's kind of to the back at the end of Princeton. And, um, and there's also a stream, a, a rather, it's more than a stream. Um, it's often, I don't know, it's like a, it's a big stream or a little river uh, that kind of runs through there as well. Not necessarily that property, but adjacent to it. So I'm just wondering again around uh, when an environmental study is done and when a stormwater study, if a stormwater study is part of that and when that will be considered. Because I think that's a, I know that's a current concern of a lot of the property owners in that area today, and um, there will be questions about how this project might impact that. Go ahead. Uh, yes, and and so similar to uh, the your question on on the last uh, the rezoning proposal, um, yeah, that that we would look at that at at the detailed, at the permitting stage. And uh, again, they would have to comply with with uh, all municipal requirements and requirements of Halifax water. And you're correct, the, the site abuts in the in the rear, abuts the Halifax water um, property. And there is an easement. There's a, a it's, it's a, I believe a sewer easement that runs through the middle of the site, um, which does impact the future placement of any building on the site as well. Um, so uh, the likelihood is that the building placement would be similar to where the school school was located. So the kind of like the higher elevation portion of the site closest to Herring Cove Road and, and further. The, the site also drops in the back uh, a fair bit. So, um, so the, the development on the site would likely be in that um, previously <laughs> developed and, and cleared area. Yeah. So. Um, I'm sure I'm out of time. I just have one, one short question about access. Sure. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just noted in the report that the access points are, um, I think, Herring Cove Road and Marie Avenue look like there's access points. It also abuts onto the back of Princeton, but as you noted, there is a, there is a slope there. Would there be, a, do you know if there's any intent to utilize that access point from Princeton? Uh, currently, no, that, that's not part of the proposal, but that the proposal that you see in the staff report, um, if at, at some point in the future that was deemed to be feasible option, then uh, again, uh, at the permitting stage, something like that would have to be looked at in more detail. Um, so I wouldn't want to say now that no, it's not possible. Um, it could be proposed, but I, I would suggest probably not likely at this point this point, um, considering, you know, if, if two access points off of Herring Cove Road and Marie Avenue actually are deemed acceptable. And so far from what we've seen through the traffic information uh, or traffic impact study, um, it, it seems okay and, and, and it will require further detail. But if those two access points are utilized, then 
there shouldn't be a need for a third one. All right, thank you. Thank you, I see no further discussions. Oh, Catherine Morris has buzzed in. Catherine Morris thank, has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple questions, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, is this on uh, well or piped water? And also, can you talk a little bit about the setback? It, it seems to me quite um, a short setback or a narrow setback between the existing homes and a fairly large institution. And finally, um, is this the maximum capacity for this building on this site? Thank you. Um. Uh, I'm sorry, so the, uh, in terms of the setback, um, it, it would have to meet the, the zone standards, which the, the, the minimum required, uh, or minimum required setback under, this, under the P, like the park and institutional zone is, is just eight feet. So it would obviously meet that, that but um, <laughs> it, it's much, the setback that's proposed is much greater than that, but um, so just, just to give you an idea of the setback, it meets what the, the zone standard is. Right. Um, but the zone standard was anticipating maybe a park, right? So. Yeah, so so the, the zone standards, um, you know, they're, I mean, there, there's potential there for, for some impact. Um, there's also no uh, zone standards for the you know the size, there's no maximum height or area to the building as well. Um, so, so that. What about guess, maximum occupancy or population density? It, it's not treated the same as okay. uh, as like in a in our three zone right. apartment building that okay. sort of thing. So no, there's there's no limit on on that in the park and institutional zone. Okay, I, I, I just, you know, foresee a few problems when you're, you're putting in, this is quite a substantial institution and it's very close to the residences. You're gonna have ventilation, you're gonna have noise from the building, heat pumps maybe, uh, there's gonna be garbage and circulation and traffic and that sort of thing. It just, it just seems like the type of zone that we have here doesn't really anticipate this scale of use in the backyard, that's all. So I, I, I appreciate your answers and, and that, that's just what my concern is, looking at it um, as, as it's um, discussed so far. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Cleary. I think that was more of a statement. Did you have a question? No, I No, yep. I wouldn't go anywhere though, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Sampson. Just a quick question, because I know this is, obviously this application has been going through for a little while, but the province just announced that for uh, care homes like this, they don't actually have to comply with municipal planning uh, rules. Um, so have you read up on that? Uh, are you aware of if this falls into that category? Uh, my understanding is at the moment we're proceeding with this proposal through the rezoning process. Um, I, at the moment, and perhaps uh, Thea can <laughs> back me up, but um, I, I don't think that's actually in place yet. Good evening, uh, members of council. Thea Langell, manager of planning applications. Uh, yes, we have read through the recently adopted legislation uh, in the Housing for HRM Act that does uh, link back to residential care facilities. But as Paul has indicated, we are proceeding with all of our applications uh, under the policy structure that we have. And if a particular area has been identified by the minister uh, for residential care, similar to how the special plan areas are identified, then we will proceed uh, once that it happens. Um, but at this particular point, that's not the case for this property. Right, okay, thank you. I thought eminent domain applied to provincial and federal stuff, whether it's explicit in legislation, but I'll talk to you about that later. Uh, we have another question from Councillor Cuddle. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, so actually that was another question I did have on my list here was about the height, because we see a floor plan, but there's no elevation 
for this plan, do you know how many stories are being proposed? The proposal is for three stories. Uh, again, that could change. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and I guess the, the, the comments I made earlier about the, the park and institutional zone, that is something technically that also could change, but not at, like at the process at, at the moment is the request is to rezone the property. Um, so I guess um, that's something that council will have to consider. Yes. So when you, what, what are you alluding to here, that we could request a different d zoning for it that would have some setback height and angle controls? Uh, no, um, but uh, in terms of this process, the request was for a rezoning of the property. Um, uh, you know, once count, if council holds a public hearing on this, then if, uh, I, I guess, council can look at what the issues are and look at that, the comments raised from the public and uh, and either make a decision uh, on that rezoning request, on this rezoning request, um, or um, there, there's other options that council could choose, I guess, but that would, I guess, involve a, a further process. Yeah, so I guess my concern is that once we approve this today, we've initiated the process. Once we go down this process of park and institutional, it will come to the public hearing, um, at which point we either have to say yes or no. And if we say no, it can be appealed and we'll say, does it meet the intent of the municipal planning strategy? And we'll go back to park and institutional and say yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering at this point, with concerns about the fact that there are no height limits, there are the setbacks are um, for park and institutional, not your regular setback requirements for other multi-unit buildings or multi-story buildings. And I don't think there's even any angle controls here. Um, what options are there to ensure that we don't get a, like a, a 30 story tower here? If, if I could, uh, I'll take that question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, and through you to Council. Um, I'll just provide uh, a, a quick reminder that the, the decision in front of Council this evening is only whether to hold a public hearing um, or not, so you're not making a specific uh, decision on the develop or the rezoning application at the moment, um, unless for some reason you feel that you wish to refuse it without um, have it holding the public hearing and hearing from the community. Um, so I just wanted to provide the clarification for that and I'll, I'll look to the solicitor if I've, I've led wrong by yeah. any means. I'd like the solicitor to clarify right yeah. now if we can, what can be appealed? Yeah. Yep, so this decision tonight can also be appealed and the it would be determined at the UARB if council's decision is reasonably consistent with the MPS. So it would be the same appeal process as if it went to the public hearing and then was rejected. Further to uh, what the solicitor has indicated, I think a lot of the questions that are being raised by council this evening, we can ensure if you are bringing this forward for public hearing to, to make sure that we've addressed all those things in our presentation and bring back that additional clarification uh, that you are seeking in terms of uh, the overview of the zone and the policy intent that can all be explained through our presentation in more detail for sure. I guess my concern right now is that I, it might not have been adequately explained in, in the report that's in front of us right now that essentially there's no controls on, on what happens with the park and institutional zone. We'll go to yeah. yeah, I think in in the report there is an indication um, that there are limited um, provisions within the zone that is correct. Um, again, it is a, a park and institutional zone kind of lending itself more to um, school type uses, um, but also residential care facilities or uh, what's also referred to as shared housing with care, which is would be the nursing home that we're looking at this evening. Um, but it is true. There are, there are limitations within that zone in terms of requirements uh, from the lot coverage and height. Uh, typically though, what we have been seeing with a lot of shared housing uh, with with special care, um, especially in this particular suburban context, you are seeing them um, kind of larger in footprint um, and not as large in height, um, just because of the nature of the, the nursing facility. 
but that doesn't give us any control that or, guar that control or, or guarantee. I think in future staff reports, we need to make that more explicit when you say there's limits to um, restrictions, like what does, okay. what does that actually mean? Well, a, a free for all is essentially what you're saying. We're, we're at time now. Thank you. I uh, will go to Councilman Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the Halifax mainland LUB, as I recall, because I had the uh, same property owners at the old Glades Nursing Home building a new uh, facility, um, Parks and Institutional, I believe, at least I recall this from meeting with their planner. Uh, looking at the design and their architect and the design, they had indicated to me that there were angle controls that they had to deal with on that site. Are there not angle controls on P zoned? Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the angle controls used to be in place on the peninsula in the former peninsula land use bylaw. No, this was a uh, mainland and, LUB. Right, and in the mainland, there, my understanding is there's not there's the same requirement for angle controls. Okay. The side yard setbacks or rear yard setbacks are, are eight feet and to a 20 foot setback from any street right of way, but no, no angle controls. Gotcha. Uh, I haven't spoken yet, if I may, I'm gonna speak briefly from the chair. We ran into this with the La Merchant St. Thomas build and the SJAM rebuild on the peninsula, which is, a, the old rules are a little bit based on the idea that the school was being built by the city, which is you know where we were at 35, 40 years ago. But there's also this idea that we trust the other order of government to engage with the public and to, to uh, you know, also have a prerogative or a pressure on them not to manifestly offend everybody in the neighborhood by building something that's really bad. So you're, you're balancing the the good of needing the school versus the the you know protection of the neighbors. So. Uh, I think both those other processes went well. One was under the old rules, one is under the new center plan rules. Uh, might be interesting when you bring this forward to have some information, or maybe not. I was gonna say, but I think it would be spurious because we're not anywhere there, but we do have new institutional park zoning in the center plan that is also still very permissive. We did not choose to make it very prescriptive. So uh, I think we have next on the list is back to Councillor Morris. Councillor Kelly, you've already spoken twice, so we're gonna have to go to Morris and you're, uh, you're at the end there. So Councillor Morris. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, there was a question I had asked that we didn't get to, and that was just if you could clarify the water and sewer um, set up for this site. Is it is it piped or is it on well and septic? And, um, and also, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I just think this uh, zone doesn't, <clears throat> pardon me, doesn't, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a bad cold. I don't think the zone anticipates the use. I mean, a school is a quite a different use than um, a fairly large care home that's going to have shift workers and people arriving, you know, at different times of the day and all of that sort of thing. I mean, this is this is gonna be quite an intensive use. There may be a few hundred people working here every day um, for this many people. So um, I, I guess I'm just asking how the zone anticipates this level of use or does it? I don't, I, I don't think it does. I think we're dealing with an, a really old zone here that didn't anticipate any kind of intense use like this. Uh, so the first part of the question about the uh, the services, yes. Yeah, so the services are available in the street. There's pipes in the street. Uh, not all houses in the area are actually hooked up. Uh, the some of the residential houses were, were developed long ago and and on well and septic tanks. Um, so, but the services are available for this site for okay. the intended use of this site to right. to okay. hook into services. Um, I guess second part of the question is a continuation of what we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, anything you wanna to add to you? Um, We're talking about a 24 hour institutional use here, which is different, quite different from a school or a park or what was there before. Mm -hmm. It's an intensification that I, and maybe you could just say if you think the zone actually anticipated that. I mean, what was anticipated, I, I, I can't really comment on that, but you're correct. I mean, it's old zoning, it's been in place um, since the adoption of the mainland land use bylaw in the late 70s. 
Right. Um, okay. So you're correct. There, it's a it's an old zone that um, you know. I, I guess one way to look at it is the zone standards may have be con may be of concern. Uh, the way we looked at it as well is that um, we have an MPS designation that states institutional use for the site, and it's, it identifies this site. So um, at the same time, it's hard to. Uh, we didn't feel we would be in a position to recommend against this proposal where the institutional designation is actually in place on this site. Um, the, there's an ability on other sites to rezone to park an institutional in mainland south without that institutional designation. It could be a residential designation, for example, but in this case where you actually have that institutional designation, that played a role in our recommendation as well. So, okay. uh, All right, thanks. Yeah. thanks very much for clarifying. So at this point, everyone who has had has had their two opportunities to speak. Uh, Councillor Stoddard, do you have anything you want to add to this fund? No. So so the motion is on the floor is before us. Uh, well, but unfortunately, you've spoken twice, and we basically turned this into a public hearing. And I'm hesitant to break the rules right now because that, in and of itself, could be a potential for us to be appealed. So so at this point, if Councillor Stoddard wants to make the motion for you. That would keep us within the rules. No, the motion's on the floor. That would be an amendment or a deferral or something like that. Okay. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I ask that staff prepare a supplementary report for clarification of what is allowable under the P and I zone, so I'm sorry, parking and insti institutional zone. Moved by Councillor Stoddard, seconded by Councillor Cuddle. The motion is on the floor. Any that is a motion to request a supplementary report and defer decision. So everybody can speak again. So that would be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad you're enthusiastic about that, Councillor Cleary. So uh, we'll move to Councillor. Uh, you want to get it up on the screen as a supplementary? Yeah, we would like confirmation, though, as to whether or not you're deferring first reading to allow the supplementary report to come back, That's or if question. you want to or proceed is it a supplementary and, and get a supplemental at yeah. the public hearing. Well, the supplementary report may or may not come back in time for the public hearing. Point. So is this a deferral with a supplementary? Yeah. Yes? Yes, sir. All right. So it is a deferral pending a supplementary report. Do we have that on the screen so that I can read it for the record? Defer first reading and request a supplementary report. Can you read the rest of the wording again then, uh, Iona? Same thing. Yeah. I'd like to request a supplementary report, staff report, for clarification of what is of it, sorry, what is allowable under the parking and institutional zone. That would be park and institutional zone. Okay, park and institutional zone. No park and institutional zone. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, institutional, not instruction. We're doing great here. It's great. It's seven thirty at night. I'm staring at it and I'm like, it's right. It's totally right. <laughs> park and institutional zone, uh, and this would be uh, for Halifax mainland. Let's add that just so for absolute clarity. All right, so we have a motion to defer, which is always in order with a request for a supplementary report. Uh, and Councillor uh, Stoddard, you, uh, would you uh, like to speak to this or would you uh, hand the floor to Councillor Cuddle? I will, uh, the Councillor of the District, speak to this. Thank you very much, Councillor Cuddle. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Stoddard, for um, bringing forward the supplementary report. I think before we go, any further with this, we need to make sure that the public has clear information about what the rezoning 
can actually, what it, what it actually entails, what is actually permissible with park and institutional. Um, I think to go out with the staff report as it is now and to go to the public, um, it, it doesn't provide enough information and clarity around how permissible this zone actually is. And, um, you know, I think if we're to actually get feedback and concerns, then, then we need to be clear on what is being requested here. So um, I support uh, I support this motion to defer and till the supplementary report comes back, and we can be um, more forthcoming with the public on on the request. Thank you, Councillor Clear. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question for staff. So I understand the intent uh, of what Councillor Stoddard and and Cuddle are trying to get to, but. Given your indication of the permissiveness of the zone, unless the applicant was going to furnish you with some plan, which I assume may or may not come, because in rezoning applications, we sometimes get a plan, we sometimes don't get a plan, it's a rezoning, um, you would have to wildly guesstimate what could be on the site. I mean, you've already described setbacks, and you know there are very other little rules. So how much can you actually bring back and say this is what could be allowed? Because that would require some imagination, I would guess, and like, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. Unlike, for example, if I was to take a zone that did have angle controls or did have a maximum height setbacks, I could mass something and say, you could build up to here. But can you do that on this site? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, uh, so so the, the staff report, the current staff report, um, indicates a three-level, 128-bed uh, long-term care facility. Um, the, so based on what, what's been said, um, the supplementary report would clarify the current z um, zone standards and uh, permissibility of, you know, uh, or, or I guess lack of control, if you will. Um, and, and so far, I guess, I guess that's, that's it. It's just a clarification of what, uh, so this is our understanding of what's been asked uh, in terms of the, star, the supplementary report. But if I draw your attention to the proposed site plan, would you bring back anything different than that like I guess I'm trying to figure out what is the information we don't have that you would be bringing back in a future report beyond what we've give, been given. Yeah, I think it would be. Oh, sorry. I think it would be simply the uh, the clarifying the zone standards. We could attach as a separate attachment the the, the actual park and institutional zone. Um, and uh, the, unless I'm wrong, that would probably be about it. Uh, we can't, the, the proposal at the moment is what it is, but we've also stated that subject to change at the permit stage, uh, as they always are with a rezoning. Uh, anything? If I could, I'll, uh, what, further to what Paul has said and actually kind of, I agree with his statement is really the, the supplementary report would contain a copy of the, the park and institutional zone. All two um, pages of it? Yeah, it's a page is, and a half. It is a limited, there is a limited zone, but if that's what council is, is looking for is a report to share that zone, we can definitely do so. We can also present it as we go forward through this process as well, um, ensure that we outline what are uh, the uses that are permitted within that zone as well. Okay. <laughs> Thank and you, Councillor Cleary. Council, Councillor Morris. Uh, could it also clarify if um, for-profit uh, institutional uses are permitted because this is a private for-profit nursing home, right, that's being proposed? Uh, correct, and, and that is a permitted use in the zone. So we could clarify that, but I'm... I'm also clarifying that tonight <laughs> that it is permitted use. Yeah, um, but the, but there are a lot of more things that go along with that, right? About the, uh, the levels of staffing and parking required and 
all of those things. I, it's just not, um, I, I think there, there is need for some clarification so that when it comes to the public hearing that people are aware that there's no maximum height, that there's no maximum area in this zone for the building, um, that it's a 24 hour a day, seven day a week operation, things like that. Yeah, and, and if council decides tonight um, uh, that we should include any uh, further information in the report, then we can do so, but we need that direction from, from you. So. Can we put the uh, motion on the screen there? If I may, I'm going to speak from here. Are you, sorry, do you have any uh, Yes, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, so my first question to staff would be that in bold below that, is that give you, does that give you anywhere, does that give you enough direction? In reviewing the, the motion that's presented, I think it would be very similar to what I've outlined, which would be a supplementary report that would provide a copy of the zone and provide a paragraph that would explain that anything within that zone would, would be possible in terms of the list of permitted uses and its form. Um, and I will share for Council um, that through this particular planning process, the planners only received two emails and two phone calls um, from the public, and we've been clear that the proposal is for a nursing home. Um, but I do understand that, yes, in terms of the clarification for the public, that what is that scale that that is possible, um, understand that that is the concern being raised by Council, and if that's the wishes through the report, we can provide that. Thank you very much. So, uh, and then my final, uh, I'm just going to, not a question for you, it's a comment to council. I'm not going to support the deferral, and I'm going to say why quite clearly, because, uh, you know, based on what we've just heard, that information is already available. We, can we could ask staff to bring it during a public hearing, but I don't want to slow down building a nursing home. And council's not in a position to either not hear this or turn it down unless we have a reason in the MPS that says this proposal doesn't meet the MPS, then we are going to be rightfully doing once again what we've been accused of by various members of the provincial government, which is not following the MPS. Legally, we can only turn this down if there is a reason in the MPS. It being allowed, but not something we would contemporarily consider uh, to be appropriate is not actually a legal reason to turn it down when we're impaneled to determine whether or not an amendment to the land use bylaw is permitted under the MPS as it exists right now. What we're really talking about is do we want to change the MPS and land use bylaw? And the answer is we do, but this is not the venue or the time to do that. So I will not be supporting the deferral. We'll go to Councillor Cuddle. Thank you. Um, I want to be clear, I'm not against um, having a long-term care facility in the community. In fact, it's something that I know we need more of in, you know, in and around Sambro Loop. Um, I think that this is more of an issue of clarity for the public participation process. And that when we bring forward a staff report that the public is gonna read and that's what they're gonna base their judgment on, then we need to make sure that all the information is contained in that staff report that's easy to understand and, and very clear about what we're doing. This isn't against the proposal as it exists in this report for a facility, uh, a long-term care facility. But we've seen time and time again, what happens once we rezone a place, then you know anything can happen that's allowable within that zone. And I think we need, this isn't about turning it down. It's not about um, you know, whether it's an appropriate use or not to have a long-term care facility. In fact, it's not even looking to hold up the, the process. That's not the intent. That's the consequence because we don't have the enough accurate information in the staff report for the public, for what I feel, for the public to be fully informed of what is being proposed through this rezoning. And there's no guarantee that what is before us um, will actually get built and as we know, things get adjusted as they go along. So I think we just need to have a fulsome discussion about this and if the community has concerns, then this is an opportunity for them to be able to express those concerns and hopefully the applicant um, will take those into consideration because we do want development to fit with, with neighborhoods and to fit with community. Um, so, um, 
that that I have, based on that, I would ask that Halifax and West support this request for a deferral and supplemental report. And just a question to staff: How long do you anticipate it will take to come back with this information? Um, Mr. Chair, to Council. I mean, mind you, it's, it is a report that I would consider to be a little bit on the lighter side, but we are moving into the holidays. Um, so I do not believe we would be able to get it back for January. I think we'd be looking closer to February. I'd have to get clarification. Is Halifax and West meeting the, f the first part of January? I just. The 16th, I mean, we will definitely do our best to, to try to move that forward. Um, but in terms of, you know, getting it tabled to the clerk's office, uh, we can definitely try for January, but it's a possibility it could be February. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not so much, you know, <laughs> I mean, the reality is they've already told us. You've already clarified. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, so there, there's nothing new, there won't be any new information and staff have to go through a process, it's gotta go back to your managers, it's gotta go up the chain, it's gotta go to legal, it's gotta come to the clerk, it's gotta be scheduled to come on uh, our agenda. And so I guess I'm with Councillor Mason on this, is we've already got the clarification. And there is no public process that'll happen again. It's not like you're gonna go back out and send more postcards to the neighborhood and say, hey, by the way, did you know that there's no uh, height restriction or no uh, angle controls? Uh, you know, send us your feedback in uh, just like we did last time. So, you know, there is no opportunity for the public other than council, uh, the, the community council here to get that information. We've already got the information. And I'll just, to Councillor Mason's point about, you know, us frigging up the process and getting blamed for, for stuff, there's a really good reason why the provincial government in the last session of the legislature uh, brought in, and I'm looking at section 229C sub 1, defining what a healthcare facility is, defining who can own, own one, including private operators, uh, and basically saying, look, we need more of these and we're not gonna let municipal councils get in your way and you don't have to have the right zoning for it. We're gonna, the minister will permit it. And so really, don't we wanna do, wanna hand John Lohr more ammunition saying, look, Halifax Regional Council is delaying by months a process that could have already happened. Um, and so I, I can't support it either because we already have the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Cleary. And I'm going to sp oh, go ahead, uh, Paul. Thank you. Um, there actually is an opportunity to, um, if, if Council were to move this to public hearing, we have to send out notices. And we typically send a, a, a fact sheet with information um, so we can actually expand on that and we could send that information in the fact sheet notification. Uh, if if that option is, uh, you know, appeases council. So staff is proposing that this be amended from a deferral to say include uh, information, uh, sub uh, include information regarding clarification of the permitted uses under the park in institutional zone. We could include the information on our website and provide the link in the fact sheet as well. So yeah, whatever. Wouldn't have to be in the motion, it's just a commitment. So if this gets voted down, you're gonna do that regardless kind of thing. Um, okay, thank you. The clerk was looking very panicky there. Uh, I'm gonna speak again just to say, I think there's a misunderstanding. I'm not saying that the public shouldn't have this information. I'm saying if the public has all the information that's being requested and then gets very upset and 100 people come and speak out against it, we still can't turn it down unless there's a reason in the MPS to turn it down. We're asking for a whole bunch of information to give the public that is irrelevant to the hearing unless it's anchored in the MPS. Otherwise, this gets overturned at the Utility Review Board like that. So I will not be supporting the deferral, and I don't think you should either. I think that we should go with what was just proposed by staff. Thank you. I gotta call the question. Any, there's nobody further on the list. I'm gonna presume question's been called. All those in favor of the deferral. In favor of the deferral. Two for the deferral. Against the deferral. Three against the deferral. The deferral has been defeated. Thank you very much, Council. So we're on the main motion. I believe the only person left who can speak in the main motion would be Councillor Stoddard for the second go around. Councillor Stoddard has nothing to say. Uh, so therefore, I'm gonna consider question called. Question's been called. All those in favor on the motion as presented. Opposed? 
Thank you. The motion is passed. Uh, we'll move to 1414, proposed 2024 meeting schedule. Uh, someone would care to put the motion on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move that Halifax West Community Council approve the proposed 2024 Halifax and West Community Council meeting schedule as outlined in the staff memorandum. Second. Second by Councillor Mortz. Anything further? Anybody? Call the question. Questions been called. All those in favor? Opposed? There are no motions, there's no in camera, there are there, there's no added items. Are there any notices of motion from members of council? Seeing none, the date of our next meeting is January 16th, 2024, uh, as we approved the uh, 2024 meeting schedule. I'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Cleary. That was a rush. Thank you very much, we are adjourned.